Um, so many things to talk about. I'm going to start with the anti-spoiler, which is that you wait until page 63, at least in the manuscript that I read, until page 63, before revealing what this book really is about, the impact of how we eat and animal agriculture on climate and the environment. What fueled that? Why wait? Why not reveal if, as you say, the climate situation is a house on fire? And that was even before the Amazon started burning, at least this last time. What, what, what was your intention there in waiting? I think I was nervous about the subject because it is... Um, it's a bit of a drag, you know, and it makes people feel defensive and it makes them feel aggressive. Um, talking about meat is not like talking about plastic straws. Um, you know, when Eating Animals came out, I would every now and then, actually, I would very often have the experience at readings of somebody who would stand up and sort of in a confrontational tone say, well, who are you to tell me this? And you're telling me that my grandparents did this, and you're telling me that this... And I would We're always, not going to be doing that later, by the way. No, I saying. invite it because I know how to respond <laughs> at this point. So what I, what I would say is, well, you obviously care a lot about this, and I care a lot about it too, so maybe that could be a starting point for a conversation because there are many, many things that I could talk about, even in a sort of didactic, finger-wagging tone that wouldn't get people upset. But right. people get upset about meat because um, we have so many... First of all, we recognize that the stakes are high. It's literally life or death, of course. And we also have so many associations. It's embedded in so many of our memories and experiences, particularly really valuable experiences, meals with friends and family, celebrations, religious experiences for some people, that to be told there's something wrong with it can feel like an almost intolerable accusation. Um... I think it's very important. The problem with climate change is not a lack of knowledge. It was for a long time, but it's not anymore. Right. Um, like with tobacco at the time. Yeah. Right. Um, America, which is not exactly at the leading edge of you know, climate change activism, in America, 9% nine, 9 of um, Americans deny human-caused climate change. Twice as many Americans believe in the existence of Bigfoot. So if you can think of anything that 91% of Americans agree on, I, I would really challenge you. Right. Um, air conditioning. B uh, believe in air conditioning? <laughs> Belief, belief in air conditioning. Yeah, I suppose that's right. You got me. Um, <laughs> the problem is not knowing, and the problem is really not caring right. either. People care. There's like a very, very... I don't meet... I don't know about you, but I just don't meet anybody anywhere from any walk of life, from any political orientation, any age, any religion or la absence of religion, who doesn't who care? Who doesn't care, right. Um, the, the problem is, how do we sustain care? How, and how do we convert care into feeling? So, you know, I was watching images of the Amazon burning um, over the past week, and when they were in front of my face, I would get really agitated and panicked and angry and depressed. And then within 30 seconds of the image not being in front of my face, I was like, where's a seltzer? Like, what would right. be nice to snack right. on right now? And right. I kind of feel like watching some YouTube videos. And, you know, as if it just never happened. And um, so we need to find ways to change the story that we tell. We need to find ways to have the conversation about climate change not be falsely politicized or divisive, but one that reveals this very broad, I would say, virtually universal consensus that it's happening and that we care about it. Um, and so in this book, I wrestled with that. Like, how do you tell a different kind of story, one that generates goodwill? Well, let me pick up on that for a moment, because you also talk at the, right at the beginning of the book about how this does not make a good story. So you say there are certain subjects that just don't make good stories, either because there's not one single identifiable enemy or because you've, you've literally said, you know, even in, I'm, I'm embarrassed, but you've talked about climate being a boring subject, 
Why is environmental catastrophe not a compelling story? Um, I think it is, first of all, very complicated. You know, um, most of us have some sense of what greenhouse gases are and how they are increasing global temperatures. But if you were to ask somebody in this audience, or even me, who's on stage, uh, how to connect the Amazon fires with the hurricane right. that's approaching Florida, with the wildfires in California. The epidemics. The epidemics, right. the droughts, the migrations. It's not easy. Like right. I could probably do it, but I'd fumble around an awful lot, and it wouldn't be a pleasurable explanation to the person listening. It also has a quality of feeling very abstract and far away. Like Climate change is what's going to happen in 30 years, or right. 20 years, or 50 years. It's what's going to happen in Bangladesh. And, but it's not going to happen. It's not happening here and now making the connection between these everyday acts and these sort of vague and seemingly distant repercussions is just psychologically and emotionally very, very challenging. Well, we're going to come back to that in a second, but I just, just to finish this notion, but isn't it something that we would want of our most creative minds to get the story out there in a way that's going to not only get people feeling as you talk about, but also move them to act. You know, you, you talk a lot about World War II. I was, I was thinking about the Vietnam War protests, for example. You know, a war far away that people initially believed in and then thought, oh, you know, what on earth? Um, but would those protests have been as effective? Would the tides have turned without the singers, the songwriters, the playwrights, you know, the Bob Dylans, whatever, doing what it was to get people out into the streets and get things changed. Don't we have another kind of story to tell here that would be compelling in that way? We live in a very different world, um, in a vastly more cynical world, in a vastly more fragmented world um, where earnestness is punished. You know? it's, can you even imagine like a folk singer, any kind of singer now, singing about climate change? It would, the person would be laughed off stage. Um, we have Greta Thunberg, who is an extraordinarily effective storyteller, um, the best storyteller when it comes to climate change. Um, and maybe because that's, that's our last hope, is the um, being upset and shamed by children. You know? um, it's not a message maybe that we can even hear from our peers are in terms of age but from the children actually I was I was going to ask you because one of my favorite books to this day about the environment is Dr. Seuss's book The Lorax mm. um, which is a very colorful but bleak book which does end on a note of hope if you remember the old onceler who's saved the last truffle tree seed you know kind of reminded me of the seed vault that you talk about in, in Norway in the book and he holds it out through the smog and drops it into the child's hands and says, unless. Do we still have an unless, or are we too late? Well, we're certainly not too late, but we're very, very close to too late. Um, and what's really scary is nobody knows when too late is going to come. Right. Uh, I can't remember any time in my life or any subject when I felt about which I felt so simultaneously hopeless and hopeful it's really strange. Like, so you I, feel that throughout the book, actually. Yeah, you really do go back and forth. There are many times when this just, it just seems like we're doomed. You know, the, the volume of change that would be necessary and the amount of time that we have to change, it doesn't compute. How is that going to happen? Right. At other times, and I would say right now, in fact, I feel extraordinarily hopeful. And It's a good sign that all these people care enough to be here to engage in this story, right? It is, it is. And this is the story that, the reason I wrote the book, in fact, is because I felt aware of so much latent will to do something, you know? Um, it seemed like every conversation I was having would involve somebody saying we have to do something. Right. The problem was, we didn't know who the we was and we didn't know what the something was. And so nobody does anything. Right. But do people feel like uh, the planet is just too big to fail in a way? Or is it more like, you know, that old marshmallow experiment with, with the Stanford 
research of, okay, if I have only one marshmallow now, or, but if I actually wait and sacrifice something for the future, I'll, I'll get a bigger reward. You know, is it that just changing our diets is too big of a sacrifice now to save the planet later? You know, different people are different. And I've been, like, regularly surprised by how... I did this um, interview with a quite far right-wing podcaster in America two weeks ago, the kind of person who I thought would, you know, rhetorically push me into a corner. I saw that, yeah. I and watched that at the end, interview. he said, I will refrain from yeah. eating animal yeah. products for breakfast and lunch. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw that. I that was impressive. plenty of, like, self-described environmentalists for whom it's too much. So different people are different. I can speak about myself, and I'd be curious to hear about your experience. Um, I have been a vegetarian for quite a long time, but an on and off vegetarian, and I fess up to that in the book. Um, I've been straight vegetarian since I was 18. That was a really long time ago. So, so <laughs> Still working on a little dairy, though. Okay? My yogurt in the morning is probably my biggest I've heard that, sin that, that Dutch yeah. people have a problem with yogurt <laughs> in the morning. Um, <laughs> I have a real problem because I, after all this time, and after all of this thought, I still find meat to be something that I want to eat. It's really appealing, yeah. Yeah, like it looks really good to me, and it smells really good to me, and the times I've eaten it, it's in it's fact tasted good. really good to me. So, um, I would admit to it being an ongoing struggle, and, um, but no sacrifice. It is in the you know looking back, it will not appear to be any sacrifice. In the moment, it does sometimes right. feel like a right. sacrifice. I would be lying if I didn't admit that you know often that meals the person across from me is eating something that I wish I could eat, um, and I'm stuck with my whatever, but uh, <laughs> my lentil whatever. Um, that was the backup title of this book, by the way. Yeah. Stuck with my whatever. <laughs> That's but my changed, memoir. Change the planet, right? Um, when people share their accomplishments with me, their ethical accomplishments, I tend to find them annoying, and I get turned. Does that off. happen often? Do they list these on of a regular, like at cocktail parties? Oh, for it? sure. I mean, parents do it a lot, right? But um, yeah, New Yorkers do it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but when people share their struggles with me. I feel inspired, actually. Like, ooh, that's hard for you? Yeah. It's also hard for me. How do right. you do it? Right. I wonder if I could do it the way that you do it. So we have to move away from measuring each other's and tabulating each other's imperfections and inconsistencies and right. hypocrisies. Um, oh, but you ate that. But you're wearing that. All but right. you flew You here. have leather shoes. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> and instead, applaud each other's progress. Right. And applaud our own and progress. And the struggles. And, and in the context of that, it's difficult to make progress. So I think there's a balance here where we need to interrogate our own limitations. Right? Like if I were to say to you, can you give up flying? If you're just being honest, it's just the two of us here. Can you give up flying altogether? What I'd, would you say? I'd say uh, I'd rather give up yogurt. Okay. <laughs> So you cannot give up flying. That you, well, you, cannot is all relative. You know, my whole family is across the ocean and I'm here. So, so you cannot give it up It would flying. be very difficult. Okay. So but could I fly less? Yeah. Yes. So how much less could you fly? If you're just being honest. If you say to me one flight less a year, I would say, great, that's your limitation. But if you're being honest, like really ask yourself. Right. I am asking you right now in real time. Well, I could, I could definitely fly a couple of times less a year. Two times less. I mean, I already fly so much less than I used to, so, you know, I used to fly several times a week. But see how this becomes, like, about apology? No, than... it's not apology. I'm just thinking, you know, how much of it is yeah. left. Um, but, yes, I think those things, like you talk about your struggle with meat, it's interesting. I gave up eating meat at the age of 18 and really have not looked back. Um, so I think... I think People have different struggles with different things, but at the end of the day, we do what we need to do. Well, we don't do what we need to or do. We, or we don't do what we need to do, or we, we do what we think we need to do on the moment. And I, I want to talk to you about this a little bit from a human psychology point of view. And it was really very interesting. There was actually an article in Time magazine just a few weeks ago that said, or the title of which is, Why Your Brain Can't Process Climate Change. 
I don't know if you, you saw it, but basically they have these functional MRIs where you can watch how the brain lights up doing different things, thinking about different things. And what they discovered is the brain just doesn't light up the same way thinking about the future. Even it's when thinking about your future self, let alone some vague sense of you know, future generations and the hordes that are going to suffer. Um, and yet there is no lobbyist for those future people to come here and, and make their case. Well, you know, there are, and they're children. And that's why Greta Thunberg's been so successful. Has been successful. And that's why people with kids have, I believe, um, a, not necessarily a more difficult time, but a uniquely difficult time ignoring the subject. Right. And maybe there's the biology in it, too, because we are biologically hardwired for fight or flight. You know, something that's immediate, the tiger is there, it's going to eat me, I run. Um, that we're, we're well designed to do. But big, future, vague things is not how we were designed. So how do we, how do we make that switch? You, you talk a little bit, well, a lot in the book, actually, about what works and the difference between feelings and actions and getting beyond things. Is it more effective to require or inspire behavioral change, in your view? So, again, different people are different, and different people respond to different techniques. I think what tends to work best is, you know, as I was saying, when the images were in front of me, I couldn't not care. Right. Um, the problem is the images aren't in front of us um, all the time. So how do we have a way to create moments of caring with the knowledge that we cannot sustain that care throughout our everyday life? Um, I think if we would force ourselves to take a 10-second pause. First of all, if we recognize the activities that actually matter, that's, that's in a way the most important first step. Um, it's good to use paper straws or no straws. It's good to recycle. It's good to plant trees. It, but these things are not high impact. There are, this is not am controversial or ambiguous. We know definitively that there are four acts that an individual can do that matter, that really dwarf all the others. And they are um, eating a plant-based diet, having fewer kids, flying less, and living car-free as opposed to having right. a hybrid or electric car. Um, so most people aren't in the process of deciding whether or not to have a kid in this given moment. 85% um, of Americans drive to work, and most American cities were designed to require cars more than half of all flights that are taken are taken either for business or for what are called um, non-leisure personal purposes right. like family visits family visits so we should we need to you know think about those activities and act with moderation but it's challenging and we should acknowledge that it's challenging food is different um, right. because it's a decision that we make three times a day or more or more um, <laughs> and one that has no nothing is requiring us to do it one way or the other. No and, one's watching. Well, hopefully people are watching, but that's another story. And, uh, and, and finally, it's the only one of those acts that immediately addresses methane and nitrous oxide, which right. are the two most potent greenhouse gases, which matter the most in the short term so that we can avoid a um, runaway climate change, a climate change tipping point. And which President Trump just loosened those restrictions on methane right. gas last week. So I think the first step is to say, okay, these are the four things I'm going to pay a lot of attention to because right. they matter a lot more. And then... More than fossil fuels. Is it? Well, I mean, flying well, and driving. Well, flying and driving, fuels, but yeah. in terms of meat, you talk about as having greater impact and yep. greater likelihood of being able to happen. Yep. So recognizing when we're making, about to make a choice, you know, which sounds kind of dumb, but it's also unless you actively do it, you don't do it. So, for example, I was planning a um, trip with my kids over winter break, and it just like went without saying in my mind that we would try to go somewhere we've never been. Um, right. Wouldn't it be great to go to Europe, or wouldn't it be great to go to South America? And I had to stop, take a 10-second pause, and say, okay, this is one of those choices that really matters. I want to go to Europe. I want to show them as much of the world as I can. But I also want to leave the world in a certain condition for them, 
let's do the train this time. If we had to fly in another situation, like I flew here, right. because I did a different calculation when thinking about whether it was worth it or not. Um, so if we could have a pause like that, 10 seconds, no more than 10 seconds, every time we look at a menu in a restaurant or go to a grocery store and are putting food in our cart and say, I want that, but wait, 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 hold on a minute. This is one of those decisions. But my I, whatever could also be delicious, right? Whatever could also be delicious. Um, maybe in some situations one would say, you know what, I am going to get that. I am going to get the steak because it's my birthday or because this chef is supposed to be unbelievable. If we were to separate out all the situations where eating meat really mattered to us, right? you know, like celebrations, amazing meals, um, family at gatherings, whatever, those comprise, I mean, what do you think those are? A dozen, 20, 50 meals in the course of the year? But also, I think one of the, one of the great things that you explain in this book, this is not binary. You're not trying to convince everyone to become vegans 100% tomorrow. And in fact, I think one of the best lines in the book, you say, you know, the, the, like the weakest excuse you can have or the best way to excuse oneself from a challenging idea is to pretend that there are only two options. When you talk about this whole spectrum, you talk about, well, what if you did, you know, no animal products before dinner? or the whole meatless Monday thing. You don't have to go cold turkey. There are options. And yeah. how do people re respond to that? I think, I mean, I, I am great. I, I, I don't go all the way. Like, I don't eat animal products for breakfast or lunch, but I do sometimes at dinner. I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not perfect. Um, there are many, many ways in which I'm not perfect vis-a-vis -vis the environment. And I forgive myself and I ask to be forgiven and I try to look at it as, hey, these are steps that I took this year. I've right. made progress. So focus on the progress, the struggle. Yeah, it's interesting how we think of, you know, this radical change that's needed and is this incremental stuff really going to add up to anything? You know, when I think about radicals, environmental radicals, I typically think about people like talking into megaphones, right. or I think about bumper stickers on cars or t-shirts. I think about words. Right. You know, this is what that radical said. This is what that radical tweeted. Um, to, words are not radical, and they're not getting us anywhere. There are plenty of people saying all the right things, and it's just not getting us anywhere. We need to find ways to convert our feeling into action. And and what, if, are, what are the ways you're most optimistic about? Because you talk about grassroots initiatives on the one hand, but also requiring structures architecture on the other. Are there a couple of examples that you could share? You know, one, I, I remember, for example, the students demanding that cafeterias really start going predominantly plant-based eating mm -hmm. on college campuses, for example. Well, what? young people think about this subject in a way that's very different than people who are, let's say, have graduated from college. Um, there are more vegetarians on college campuses in America than there are Catholics. There are more vegetarians than there are any field of study, like economics, psychology, really? math. Yeah. This is not some sort of fringe right. identity. It used to be the case even maybe five years ago that um, more people were vegetarian than would admit to it because it was like a little bit weird. For the same reason I had a hard time introducing yeah. the subject in the book. It was that piece in the New York Times, just, you know, stop dissing the, the vegans. I don't know if you read that. Yeah. It was a, I'll give you a copy later. But he's basically saying we should thank these people. Stop making them feel embarrassed. Now there are more, uh, more people admit to being vegetarian than are actually vegetarian. Because <laughs> it's become an aspirational identity. You right. know, Jay Z and Beyonce just started, uh, they're very into advocating for plant based diets, and they started this um, raffle where if you change to a plant-based diet, you could win tickets to their concerts for life. Um, wow. You know, the um, Beyond, writing this down. Beyond Meat, this company that I believe is now in the Netherlands as well, had yeah. the largest IPO in the last 20 years Huge. in yeah. the American yeah. stock market. Um, the, I just, I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But... Everything is pointing in one direction. 
And it is the right side of history. You know, the, the question it is... is the, it is the right side of history. And if the question is, how long will it take to get to the other side? And if someone were, you know, a visitor from the future were to say, in two years, half of all meals in America will be vegetarian, I would believe that. It sounds like an absolutely crazy thing to predict, but the culture is changing so quickly, and this is going to happen... Um, as a, we've had incremental change for a long time. We've been building up to a moment for a long time. So we might get a tipping point, so to speak, you think? Yeah, I think so. Can we talk about politics for a moment? Don't worry. I'm not, I, what's so interesting, you talk about how in the book, you don't really delve deeply into politics, and you note that environment and climate issues not only need not be, shouldn't be, but have not always been political. When did it, when was it decided that saving the planet or eating the right thing to save the planet or any of the above was a progressive, liberal, Democrat, Green Party type of issue? How did, how did that happen? I think it's just part and parcel of the um, like zero-sum game that modern life has become, that every, everything has to involve a winner and a loser. Um, I do not believe that liberals care more about the environment than conservatives. I don't believe that Democrats care more about the environment than Republicans. I think that the optics of environmentalism have been um, hijacked by right. progressives yeah. and has created a, has made it into a game where um, people are trying to score points. And there's nothing more I mean, the word conservation is root is conservative. Conservative, right. And the future that we need is not science fictional. It's not people eating, um, you know, soy pills. It's just eating like our grandparents ate and right. farming like our grandparents farmed right. and exercising moderation. Like what Michael Pollan calls eat real food, something your great-grandparents would have recognized. Yeah. But even in, in the democratic debates this summer in the U.S., when the discussion did turn to climate, it still was pretty much all about fossil fuels. The meat, the agricultural issue, the factory farming didn't come up once. You know, what is, is keeping that, is the invisible force under the rug, is it because it just sounds too hokey and embarrassing for a candidate? To, and, and Jay Inslee are one, you know, climate candidate is now out of the race. Is it just because people think this is never going to get me votes? I mean, I have been at many dinner parties where I despise the moment that I have to tell everybody I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> right. I just don't like it. It makes right. me uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable to think of them being uncomfortable. Why? It's the right thing to be. It is the right thing to be. If you are interested in reducing the amount of violence in the world and the amount of destruction in the world, this is the best possible way to do it. Why is it embarrassing? Because it is. Because we live in a culture that has, for thousands of years, eaten in a hunter-gatherer. Yeah, well, a hunter-gatherer and then farmer, and that. But then, about seventy years ago, factory farmer, and that really changed everything. Right. And um, that disconnect or that break in the sort of continuity of agriculture is something that's not really dinner table conversation. You know, it's a little complicated. It's a little. Uh, unsavory. Unsavory. So what is the right context to talk about these things? And that's a struggle that I've really had. And I should also admit that my own feelings, despite having now written two books that touch on the subject or in different ways of animal agriculture, my own feelings are shockingly unsettled. You know, There are moments when I was writing this book which is very much about like incremental change. You know, the, the sort of argument of the book is let's refrain from eating animal products for breakfast and lunch. There are moments when I thought, what are you doing? This is just wrong, 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 Just wrong. that it has to be much more extreme. We've got to just stop. Yeah. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Right. And we have to stop. Uh, I sometimes wake up, honestly, at night and think, I am telling a lie. I'm writing a lie. This, is, this incremental stuff 
it, this is the wrong side of history. This is wrong. But then there's another part of me that thinks, okay, well, what's the goal? You know, the goal is to lessen the amount of violence, lessen the amount of destruction, and to appreciate that humans aren't ethical robots. Right. And that this choice is not independent of the rest of our lives. We have these rich emotional lives with all of these like beautiful food associations and beautiful food memories. And now you talk about the cultural aspects a lot in the book also. Yeah. yeah. So why do I bring this up? Because I think it's a really tricky subject and it's a rich subject to discuss. Um, despite the fear that I often have in raising it, I've actually never had a bad conversation about it. Um, if it's approached by, from both sides with a kind of humility and openness, it's a great way at getting at what is important to you as a human. And I don't mean um, exclusive to the question of meat. Just like, what is valuable about life to you? Like, what is valuable about sentience to you? If nothing matters, right? Yeah. Then what's, what's worth saving? What are your limits? What are my limits? How can we negotiate our limits? Do we... This is an unfair question, but do we deserve to lose the planet if we are not taking care of it properly? I mean... No. Or... I mean, nobody deserves um, what could happen. And also, there is no we. There is like, no we. Do children deserve to lose the planet because their parents couldn't get it together? Couldn't, couldn't change their diets. Not. And I think that we're not getting it together and we ultimately might not get it together. The explanation isn't that we're evil. The explanation is that it's a real struggle to get the balances right as a human. And um, I've yet to meet the person who gets the balance perfectly right. And I... Um, but even getting in the right direction is already, what you're saying, a big step of progress, right? And we're doing it. What you're talking about now and you're thinking this is not about, you know, we're going to be extinct and you talk about this is not the apocalypse, but, but those lucky survivors have a pretty horrible scenario, you know, if you play it out. And it reminded me of also this um, memorial plaque that they just put up for the lost glacier in Ireland, uh, in, uh, in uh, Iceland, saying this monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you in the future, we'll know if we did it. And you have this very, very moving part toward the end of the book, part that really actually brought tears to my eyes, where you describe this future of having had this brief experiment with humanity. Um, and you have a list of these tiny, intimate things that you capture that suddenly feel like this bittersweet part of a past. And it really is always those little things that we miss, isn't it? You know, if you lose someone you love or you leave a place that you loved being or living in. And I was wondering if you would indulge us just by reading us that little passage because these, these little moments are just so wonderful. Um, Do you know where it is? Yeah. All right. So you can uh, okay. just from here to here. Yeah, okay. You were afraid I was going to go flipping through, weren't you? Um, At whichever one of those two starting yep. points you want. Uh. So even if humans survive global warming, the next proverbial flood will almost certainly end our short reign on this planet. It could be a lethal virus, a drought, an ice age, a volcanic eruption, or perhaps resource scarcity will spark a final war. At some point, if not on our first try, we will get death right. And then our planet will orbit unintelligently for the rest of time. An unintelligent rock among unintelligent rocks in an unintelligent universe. The brief experiment with human consciousness, with learning words, planting seeds, sizing the space between monkey bars, twisting loose teeth, trick-or-treating with pillowcases, sliding pencils under casts, making stove, pop, stove pipe hats and beards from construction paper, Folding cranes, planting flags, folding poker hands, sharing selfies, wrestling down jealousy, raising pylons to bring electricity to remote communities, raising pylons for beautiful bridges, rowing sailboats in the doldrums, lowering flags to half-mast, struggling to refold maps, 
sizing engagement rings, launching telescopes to see even farther into the past, cutting umbilical cords, amortizing, testing the heat of milk against wrists, reshingling roofs, making way for ambulances, racing hurricanes, preparing wills, misremembering childhood homes, choosing cancer treatments, crumpling inadequate eulogies, setting clocks a few minutes fast to fool oneself, turning off lights to save electricity or a free way of life, will be forever unremembered. I'm just going to go a tiny bit further. Yeah, yeah. Or perhaps there will be life after us. And perhaps the next inhabitants of what once was our home will arrive soon enough after our disappearance to find artifacts of our tenure. Fragments of stone constructions, pieces of plastic, unusual distributions of silicon. Perhaps they will find human handprints left in a cave in southern Argentina, which date to 7300 BC, and human footprints on the moon, and assume that these were equally primitive expressions or equally sophisticated. Perhaps they will arrange our remains in a museum, accompanied by texts, hypothesizing our intentions and what it was like to be human. And then here's the text that they would write in the future. They preferred groups as small as two. They consumed food when not hungry, engaged in non-procreative sex, sexual activity, and acquired superfluous possessions and knowledge. They struggled with hydration and gravity. They recorded experience with writing implements that disappeared with use. Their hair usually changed color, but their eyes usually did not. They brought their hands together to express approval, and even non-believers concealed their feet. They lifted heavy objects, rearranged their teeth. The living needed distance from the dead, but the dead needed proximity to one another. They had names, although very few had unique names. They had numerous languages and systems of measurement, but no universal language or system of measurement. They paid strangers to touch their backs. They were drawn to chairs, helpless things, privacy, and exposure, but nothing in between. Reflective minerals, rectangular pieces of glass, organized violence. Each group selected members to worship. They struggled to remain conscious in the dark. They had no armor plating. They sought mirrors to confirm the existence of what they didn't want to see. They had severely limited vision. They passed their death date every year without acknowledging it and pushed their breath into rubber bladders to commemorate being born. Their needs were too great. Doing nothing to save their kind required the participation of everyone. Every one of them began as a baby, and collectively they were, relative to the history of this planet, extraordinarily young. Thank you.